Does this little light thing work in here? Sure. <laughs> it doesn't? No. Stage prop. Why is he got you need it on? Yeah, I'm gonna be reading from something. Um I, I'll be able to flat use my flashlight, I think. Hold on. Oh wait, maybe it does. Hold on.
you go. Karen, can you hear? Karen, Karen. Did you hear it now? No, can you try it again? Testing, testing, testing. Did you hear it? No. I'm going to try one more time. It's a little delayed. Testing, testing. Can I please have everyone's attention? Good morning. My name is Paul Cavana, and I have the great privilege of being the principal here at Fairfield Ward High School. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge a very special family we have um, in attendance tonight, the Cusco family. Please a round of applause for the Cuscos. I'm also very thankful to have members of the Board of Education here tonight supporting our work, as well as people from the um, FCAC and CIAC. So I am going to um, introduce uh, Mr. Cusco, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Mr. Cusco.
I mean, I mean this is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, today is November 4th, exactly nine months after Kevin took his life. So it's appropriate that we're all here um, trying, to, trying to show support. Um, Kristen and I want to thank the students and community for your support. When I think back to the, the vigil outside our house, the wake, the Ward Ludlow game, the teal out at Ward, there was so much love in the air. And I would like to think that if Kevin knew how much love was out there for him, he would have made a different choice. He would have chosen life. Our town has been through a lot with the death of Jake Panis and Kevin. I know there are people out there struggling there, here today. I know that. I want you to believe that there is love for you too out there. And I want you to choose life. I want you all to know that taking your life is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And if you do need help, and you're not sure where to turn to, there is a National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-TALK. At the teal out, I talked about the concept of afterglow. In Kevin's eulogy, the Reverend Alita Ward said that a student wrote that Kevin's afterglow will last forever. That afterglow will be in every moment of kindness that someone offers to another because they remember Kevin offering it to them. His afterglow will be in every selfless act that someone does because they witnessed it in Kevin first. His afterglow will be in that moment when someone refuses to leave another until they see them smile because they remember Kevin, Kevin's persistence with them. His afterglow will be pulling over to help because they remember Kevin sprinting down the road to tend to a hurting man. His afterglow will be seen in a student who sold bracelets for mental health awareness and donated the proceeds to Kristen and I. His afterglow will be seen in a group of students who chose to start a nonprofit and donate the proceeds to Will to Live. His afterglow will be seen in a community when a high school football stadium chants, we love Kevin. His afterglow will be seen when childhood friends embrace the one town concept and can be rivals instead of enemies. Kevin's afterglow will be seen in each of us lives a little harder cares a little deeper, and holds a little tighter. We can all honor Kevin by spreading his afterglow. In April, FCI Commissioner and Ward Athletic Director, Director Dave Schultz had asked me if I ever heard of John Troutwine, and I had not. So I did like any, anyone else would do, I Googled him. And I found the Will to Live website and watched his speaking engagements. There were too many similarities. John's son, Will Troutwine, and Kevin Kutso play the cross. John's speaking to student athletes in my background with youth sports. How many kids here have I coached? How many kids have played uh, Fairfield Youth across boys or girls? Awesome. Um, and my grandfather founded the FCAC, and my father was a commissioner for the, of the FCAC for, for 38 years. And now the FCAC is adopting the Life Teammates program. I have found a purpose and a way I can deliver the message of mental health awareness and suicide prevention. But most of all, I found hope and support from John, a total stranger who called me to let me know that he was 10 years out from his son Will taking his life and that I could survive too. You see, it's those little things that you can do to make a difference in someone's life. So without further ado, I would like to introduce a man who has been an inspiration and a mentor to me. Let's give a big Fairfield welcome to John Troutline. Oh my gosh, okay. Jim, I love you, pal. Love you, man. Nicely done. Good morning, everybody. It is, uh, it's very fun for me to be back. 
a couple years ago, I stood up here and spoke, I think it was to the, was it the upperclassmen or was it just the senior class? Juniors and seniors. About this concept of being a life teammate and the power that we all have to make each other's lives a little bit more fun, to improve the relationships in our lives, and perhaps most importantly, deliver hope to each other. Because life is hard, and it's really hard right now. So my goal today, as I walk you through this, this story that I'm going to share, which is unfortunately all too similar to what you just heard, and my goal is to have all of you guys perhaps look at yourselves in the mirror just a little bit differently tonight. And hopefully you look at yourselves and say, I have the power to deliver hope, because you do. And when you do that, you increase the will to live. And that's why I'm here. I am not here to prevent suicide. I am here to increase the will to live. And if I can do that, suicide will be prevented. But the message I'm going to use is a message <clears throat> that was taught to me by my friends and my colleagues and my, and my life teammates. First quick introduction. My name is John Troutwine. I grew up in the Chicago area. I have four wonderful children, Will, Tommy, Michael and Holland. My wife is Susie. <clears throat> we live in Atlanta, just north of the Atlanta city, home of the world champion Atlanta Braves. I'm just going to say that. Although I rather would have seen the Red Sox, but who knows? Maybe next year. Um, I run, I'm the chief customer officer for a global IT services company. I've been doing that for about 18 years. I graduated from Northwestern University a long time ago. I am brought here today by two of my teammates from Northwestern who I met when I was a teenager that are still so close and are there for me and have delivered hope to me when I needed it. After Northwestern where I played baseball, I had the wonderful opportunity to play seven years in pro ball. I was signed out of college by the Montreal Expos. That shows you how old I am. They don't exist anymore. And uh, most of my time was spent seven years, six of them in the minor leagues, and then one very, very fun year playing in the big leagues with the Boston Red Sox back in 1988. If you Google me, guys, like Jim did, you will be disappointed because I wasn't very good. But boy, did I have fun, and man, did I have a lot of teammates, teammates that loved me, teammates that were there for me, teammates that saved me. There's a picture of my wife there on the, on the left, far left. Uh, she's playing lacrosse. She was a lacrosse and field hockey player at the University of Virginia, perhaps the true athlete in the family. She also had a lot of teammates that helped her, that loved her, and saved her. So our whole parenting was based around teammates, and good teams win, and, and great teams love each other. When I was doing my coaching, the, my players heard every cliche you could think of. And I never, ever toned it down. It was always about love your teammates, love your teammates, love your teammates. I'd rather have a good teammate who can't hit than a terrible teammate who can hit. So they heard it all and they would roll their eyes. But you know what? We had fun. We had a happy, loving, and we still do a happy and loving home. My marriage is awesome. Susie and I love each other. She's nuts about me. <laughs> and I'm nuts about her. And if you ask the people in our neighborhood about the trout wines, they'll say, yeah, they got it going. They're living the dream. But the dream ended 11 years ago, 11 years and two weeks ago. <clears throat> when our oldest child, our son Will, who was 15 and a freshman in high school at the time, lost his life to an illness that he didn't know he had, and an illness that his family didn't know he had, an illness that his friends didn't know he had. He didn't choose the illness. You don't choose illnesses. And as a result, he didn't choose to die. 
the illness killed him. Big, strong, healthy, happy, successful, good student, good athlete, incredible musician. He was the lead singer in a band. He wrote songs at his eighth grade graduation. His band played to screaming kids and he was the man. He was the consultant. He was the leader. <clears throat> he was one of those kids that truly rejoiced in the success of his friends. Not a jealous bone in his body. <clears throat> Being an athlete who played at a pretty high level, I used to say to Will, you know, you could be that guy. You could be the guy that's scoring the goals and doing those things. I'm good, Dad. I'm good. He was about the ground ball. He was about the pass. He was about setting his friends up to score. What a wonderful trait he had. And I think that trait sounds awful familiar, doesn't it, Jim? Army of friends. And it was so much fun to see him with his friends. And they were devastated, and they are devastated. This is put together by his brother, Tommy, who's singing. The weekend that he passed, I kept saying to myself, how could a young man living in our loving home, a young man who knew how much his father loved him, how could he lose the will to live? How does that happen? Look at these friends, look at this vigil, look at these, uh, the, the outpouring of love and affection for him was incredible, just, just as the Cusco family found during that tragic time in their lives. But that very weekend, people kept coming up to me and they started telling me stories about their friend and their neighbor and their brother and their roommate and their mother. Everybody had a story. And people that I had known for a long time had a story that they had never told me. Your brother took his life 10 years ago and you're my next door neighbor and you never told me, you never talk about it? Oh, we don't talk about it. Why? Oh, we just don't. And I remember thinking, 
nobody talked about it. Will didn't talk about it. No, I, nobody knew anything, and I was so upset, and I was trying to figure out how am I going to get through this, and, and I started to, to become educated on the statistics. One in five of you suffer from depression. One in five of the adults in this room suffer from depression. It is here. It is real. It is a physical deformity. It's not a character flaw. It's not a choice. It's an illness that is treatable, beatable, common, curable, and it's okay. But nobody knew that, at least in my community, nobody knew that, and Will didn't know that. Why is he not happy? Why am I not happy? What is wrong with me? Why am I not like anybody else? He didn't know what was wrong with him, and his father had no clue that there could be something wrong with him because I was uneducated and unaware, and because I was uneducated and unaware, I lost my son. I'm convinced of it. Every 13 minutes in America, somebody takes their lives. Every two hours, it's a teenager. I'm going to give six speeches, eight, seven, seven, eight speeches in the next two days, and 24 teenagers are going to take their lives during that time. Because depression is, has a stigma to it, and people don't want to talk about it because they're embarrassed about it, or they're unaware about it, they're uneducated about it, and we've got to find a way. And I remember learning this literally the weekend that he died. Like, how am I going to get people to talk about it? How am I going to get kids to talk about it? How am I going to get other families to realize that that handsome, happy, well-to-do family is the face of suicide in America? It was mind-blowing to me. It was devastating to me that I didn't know any of this. And I was this father who was, who was always trying to be there. And I remember thinking, I've got to find a way to get people to talk. And then I gave the eulogy at his funeral. Three days after he died, on Monday, the 18th of October, 2010, I am standing in a church and it's overflowing. It wasn't even my church because my church wasn't big enough. We had to use the bigger church down the street and it was just packed. And, and I'm giving this eulogy talking about Will and how he loved, <coughs> he loved his teammates and, and being there for his teammates was more important. So you guys just love each other and honor where Will love each other because that's what Will would want. <coughs> just like Jim just said, that's what Kevin would want, carry his light. And then I started to notice. There's Mark Savard. Mark Savard was the other guard on my seventh grade basketball team. There's Jimmy Bartels. Jimmy Bartels was the first baseman on my Little League team. I played the trumpet in grade school band. There's Randy Karen. I used to sit next to him in the trumpet in the band. There's Tick. There's, there's Modge. There's Scooch. There's Juker. Over 30 of my best friends in life had traveled from all over the country in two days' notice to be at this funeral, to be there for me. And as I was looking and giving this eulogy and noticing these faces, some of them I hadn't even communicated with for 30 years, they were there for me. And while I was giving the eulogy, I don't know how the good Lord just, just blessed me with this thought, I know what I'm going to do because the greatest friends I ever had, the friends that I learned about life with, the friends that I went through the trenches with, the friends that I called when I got signed to the Red Sox, the friends that I invited to my wedding, every single groomsman in my wedding was there. Every single godfather to my kids was there. The greatest friends that I ever met, my life friends were in that audience at the funeral and it hit me that every single one of them I met when I was a teenager, when I was Will's age, when I was your age. Oh, had Will known that, had Will understood that he had already met his groomsmen, he had already met his life's friends, his life teammates. And this is going on through my mind while I'm giving a speech figure that one out. But I knew I was going to be able, because of these guys that are in the audience, I'm going to create a foundation that works to show kids that they have already met life's best friends and that true hope and true love and most importantly, gang, true understanding of you and what you're up against 
is sitting right next to you in this auditorium, in the classroom, in the dugout, on the sidelines, in the youth group, in the choir, in the band, in the orchestra, in the scouting group, in the church, wherever you might be, you have already met your life teammates. And that's where it came. You guys have the power to deliver hope to each other because who better understands you? Who understands you guys the best? Your mom, your dad, or your friend? Guys, it's your friend. It will always be your friends. And sometimes it's hard for parents to understand that. Nobody knows my child like I do. We talk every night. Nobody knows. We have a great relationship. Trust me, he's not telling you everything because you didn't tell your parents everything. I guarantee it. And that's okay. So let's create this culture where we encourage you guys to talk to each other and be there for each other and understand each other and show that understanding. And if you can do that, you're going to increase the relationship. You're going to talk more. And I remember thinking, and as I gave these speeches about life teammates, and I said to the, I said to the girls in the stands, okay, there's five girls in the front row here, four girls in the front row. This Saturday, you four girls are going to get married. This Saturday is your wedding day. Who are your bridesmaids? You got to think of six of them. Who are those six? Right? And, and you guys, you five guys in that third row there, you're getting married on Saturday. Who are the six groomsmen you're going to have? Think about that one. And now answer this question. Do they know? Who are your life teammates is a good question. Do they know is a better question. And what I'm trying to do here, guys, if you communicate to your friends that you are here and you are there and you want to be there for them in the good, in the bad, in the happy, in the sad, maybe they will talk to you. Talking is therapy. Expression is therapy. Will never did it. He kept it in. And I want to encourage you all to realize that you have friends that could use a chat. All you adults in this room, you have friends that could use a chat. And so if I can get you kids to recognize the love and hope that you have sitting next to you, maybe you will talk to each other. And you know what happens when you do that? Your relationship gets better. Whether you have depression or not, your relationship gets better, and that's a good thing, and life gets a little bit more fun, and you have someone that you can share these things with. That's what the foundation is all about. Getting to understand the love and hope that is sitting right next to you. And, and I was so excited about it, and as I started to get asked to speak, and I was getting speaking, I started mostly speaking to, to teams and sports because of my baseball background, and, and I, I started to, to get to know these kids and spend time with kids your age, with you guys. And I recognize something that I never, ever realized. You have it really hard. You all have it harder than I did when I was your age. You all had it harder than your mom did, than your dad did, than your coach did, than your athletic director did, than your teacher did, than your principal did. Every single trusted adult in your life did not have it as hard as you do growing up in this era. And when I give that speech to parents, and I'll be doing this tonight, I'm going to get the look. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I walked uphill both ways in the snow with no shoes, and you're telling me that my son has it harder than me? And I'll say, keep it coming. You got, what else you got? Uh, well, I didn't get my first car until I was 20. Yeah, your son has a BMW now. Yep, 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 keep it coming. What else you got? You finished? Yep. Dad, did you have that? No. I win. What comes with this? What comes with the internet of things? What comes with this 24-7 barrage of constant information is unlike anything that the adults in your life had to deal with. And I never, ever knew that. Never once in my life did I say to Will, wow, this sucks. This is really hard. I did not have to get straight A's in AP classes to go to Northwestern. But the University of Georgia came down to his school and said, you better do that. 
Dad went to Northwestern. Mom went to University of Virginia. Will's not in any AP classes. He can't even go to the state school in Georgia. We never even talked about schools. But this, but society did. And, and these, while I was saying, isn't this awesome, Will? Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? Look at these schools. Look at these fields. Look at these travel teams. Look at these awesome things, these phones, these, all these gadgets that you have that I never had. Isn't life great, Will? Isn't it awesome? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? <coughs> and with every positive syllable that I uttered, I pushed him farther away from me because it wasn't great. And I just didn't know it. I didn't realize the, the, the constant 24-7 attack on him, whether it was academically, whether it was athletically, whether it was socially, right? And you look at these schools. You guys are all starting to apply to schools. You're applying to schools now. There's not enough spots. There just isn't. The world has gotten smaller. The world has gotten more competitive. The world has gotten more global. It's really hard to get into that college that you want to go to. And it's not because you're bad. It's because there's not enough spots. And when you or your friend get that rejection letter, and unfortunately, guys, it's going to happen, please remember me. Because it's not the school. It's not the school. Every single boss that I have ever had in my career did not go to a school as academically acclaimed as Northwestern University, yet every single one of those bosses deserved to be my boss. It's not the school, it's you. They're all good schools. Remember that. And when you go to that first job interview, I guarantee you nobody is gonna to say to you, what'd you get in AP Lit at uh, Fairfield Ward your junior year? Oh, a B, <laughs> that's gonna hurt you. Nobody asked me my grade point average. Nobody asked me what classes I took. They didn't. They looked me in the eye. They saw how I shook my hand. They saw my presence as I walked in. Am I going to have a sense of urgency? Am I going to show up early? Am I going to stay late? They, they looked at how I was going to help deliver success to that company. What kind of a teammate am I going to be? What kind of a team player am I going to be? All of that stuff. You don't get that from the degree. It comes from you. So I beg you guys to remember that because that is the number one cause of stress and anxiety in kids your age. And stress and anxiety, coupled with the illness of depression, is a battle. So let's keep talking about it. Let's keep remembering, guys, it's hard to get into these schools, especially in this area where there's just so many and it's so competitive. Just understand that. Because when you're 30 and you say your vows and you walk down the aisle, I guarantee you you're not going to say, I still can't believe I didn't get into Georgia. You won't. It's not the school. It's you. I stood on the mound, Fenway Park, in a Boston Red Sox uniform, as high as you can possibly get in baseball. I would not make Fairfield Ward's baseball team if I grew up today. I would not make it. You know why? Because when I was 10, I was a dork. And I wouldn't have made the travel team. And I would have had to find a new sport. But back in 1972, when I was 10, the world was a little bit more patient. There was no such thing as travel teams. And, and it allowed me to grow and get stronger. And I gained 100 pounds and grew 8 inches during my high school career. And I got a scholarship to Northwestern in March of my senior year. Today, you're committing as sophomores. Isn't this awesome, Will? Isn't this awesome, Will? Isn't this awesome, Will? It wasn't awesome. Social media. <laughs> when Debbie Feeker dumped me, which she so regrets, <laughs> when I was 15, nobody tweeted it. My relationship status in Facebook didn't change like Will's did when his girlfriend dumped him. No one, it wasn't on Snapchat. There was no Instagram. When I fumbled in the high school football game, I didn't have a million hits on YouTube. The kids of today wake up knowing that if they make a mistake, everybody they've ever known will know about it by dinner. That's hard, guys. I always used to say, people ask me, what's the difference between the minor leagues and the big leagues? I said, oh, that's easy. In the minor leagues, when I was playing for Pawtucket, when I gave up a home run, all 500 people knew that I stunk. In Boston, when I gave up a home run, 
All 35,000 people knew it, and every single newspaper in the country talked about it the next morning. I was 25. I was making a lot of money. I was pitching in the big leagues when that was happening. Same thing's happening to you guys right now when you're 17, 18. This is really hard, and I'm impressed with you. I'm impressed at how you navigate through it. I'm not sure how I would have done it when I was your age. Had I faced these obstacles, yes, the opportunities are greater. Yes, the opportunities are more prevalent. But with those opportunities come pressures that I didn't have at that young age, that you guys do. So every once in a while, don't be afraid to pat yourself on the back on how you're navigating through this difficult life that you live right now. Because it is hard. And, and I wish as a parent, I wish as a coach, I wish as a teacher, I would have said to my kids, wow, this sucks. I don't, I don't have the answer. I never once said it to Will. I say it to my other kids now. I don't think Will ever said, yeah, dad gets me. I wonder how many of you think your dad or mom truly get you. If they don't, go easy on them. They're trying. They love you. It's a different world than what they grew up in. So be patient with them. Talk to them. Throw them a bone. Because there's no class on parenting. There isn't. We just love you. And we don't like to see you not okay. And when we see you not okay, we have to fix it. And we have to fix it now. And, and I used to say to my kids, I was all-knowing daddy. And I was always going for that father of the year award by, by being positive and being, being an uh, inspirational Positive mental approach. I always had the positive approach. Always there. Always positive. I'm in this great. This is going to be good. You're going to be fine. And when his girlfriend broke up with him, I talked about Debbie Feeker and how she regrets it now. I said, look at your mom. She's hot. I turned out great. That's going to happen to you too, Will. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And I hugged him and I wiped away his tear and I went upstairs thinking, yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. I'm not fine. I want to die, Dad. Gosh, I wish he would have said that to me. He never did. Depression is maskable. It's hideable. There's a stigma to it. So let's create a culture where it is actually okay to not be okay. And never in the history of this country has it been more prevalent that it's okay to not be okay. What you all and what we all have had to go through over the past two years with the pandemic and the and the and the uh, the racial dynamics and the political, it's been, a, it's been a mess and it's been difficult and it's loaded with in, in, you know, um, uncertainty. It's okay to not be okay, guys. And that's something that I had to learn and I learned after we lost our son. So when the foundation started and people are, are relating to this message of life teammates and be there for your life teammates because it's the life teammates that really understand you, so talk and talk and talk. And then I thought, okay, well, what if I have a, meet a friend who says, yeah, I'm struggling. What do I do? What's the, what's the stop, drop, and roll for this, right? And, and there was a company not far from here, up in Wellesley, Massachusetts, that say you act. You acknowledge and you care and you talk about it. You acknowledge that life is hard, something I never did for Will. I never acknowledged that he had it hard. I kept saying he had it great. Care, I did show that. He knew I loved him. But I didn't say it in a way that says, hey, I know this, I, know, I want you to know that I know this is really hard, but I'm here, and if I can help you, let me know how. I didn't try to have an answer. Unfortunately, that's not how I acted with him. That's how I act today. And telling a trusted adult, that's the talking part about it. That enables you guys to get help. There are so many wonderful organizations out there in counseling and therapy that, that can, that can Make it okay to not be okay. We're going to take you now through um, an example. If you look at that picture of Will's lacrosse teammates that, that started, um, they had a team, Will, to live lacrosse. And they played in a tournament down at Georgia Tech. And everybody was like, what the heck is this? They're purple, my Northwestern influence on them. They had their purple uniforms, will to live on the back. They didn't have their names. They had life teammates. And at the end of the game, they, they handed out these wristbands that say, love you, man, to the other team. And it was like, 
And people said, How, can I play on this team? Can I be on this team? Because it was about being there for each other. Oh, by the way, they won the tournament. Interesting how that works. Braves just won the World Series. What did you see in every single interview? When the Red Sox won the World Series, when the Patriots won all those games, what, this team just loves each other. We just really love each other. I hear, love you, man, love you, man. We just love each other. We be there for each other. We love each other. Good teams win. And great teams love each other because the teammates can really help you get through. So we're going to have some fun here. And uh, the, the video that's going to play here on the left is Fenway Park, 1988. It's my third game pitching for the Red Sox. It's against the Oakland A's. That's Jose Canseco at second, and Mark McGuire is the batter. Until now, I had been pitching really well and thought, man, I got this. I hate Mark McGuire. <laughs> that ball not only went over the green monster in left field, it went over like the 50 foot of netting that's above the green monster in left field. It went over Lansdowne Street on the other side of the green monster and went over the bars that we used to go to after the game in Lansdowne Street and landed somewhere on the Massachusetts Turnpike. <laughs> See, Bogues, you, why do you always do that? I couldn't even blame, how skinny he was, I can't even blame steroids. Guys, you're looking at and listening to the guy who gave up the longest home run in the history of Fenway Park. <laughs> that sucked. That was awful. There was nothing good about that one. There was nothing good about that. I was a mess. Play of the game, ESPN showed it a thousand times. My friends were calling me up, how's your neck? And it was just, it was just, um, it was bad, right? I mean, I'm serious. It, I was really upset. I was going to get back, you know, I spent my whole life trying to make the major. Now I go back to Pawtucket and the bus rides. And I was like, oh my gosh. I, and, and the next day I had lunch in Boston at a restaurant with my very best friend's big brother. So it was, it was Paul Tickey's big brother. Paul and I played, played high school and college baseball together. We grew up together. His big brother used to, used to pitch to me in the backyard. So Al Tickey's in the stands with me and, or in, at the game. I left him and three of his work colleagues tickets. So I'm at lunch, and he knows I'm not happy. I just gave up this moonshot that people are still talking about to Mark McGuire. And he says to me, John, can I ask you a question? <sighs> yeah. Is it safe to say, John, that when you were a kid, you dreamed about someday striking somebody out in the major leagues? I'm like, what? He says, you heard me. And I said, well, yeah. He goes, dude, you did that last night. I was in Fenway Park in row 13 behind the Red Sox dugout watching my little brother's best friend dressed in a Boston Red Sox uniform pitching in Fenway Park. I saw him not only get his first, but his second major league strikeout. John, I was so happy for you that you were able to achieve this lifelong dream that we, I know you talked about that with my brother. I know it those late nights when you were 13 and 14 and 16 and all that hard work you did. And I remember sitting in the stands and there was tears in my eyes and his colleagues said, yep, he was crying. It was really embarrassing. And I just was so happy for you that you were having such a wonderful thing happen to you. You know what I said to him? I did. I had no idea that on that very night that I had achieved something that I had strived for my entire life. Sometimes it takes a friend. I went back 
to the Red Sox locker room that afternoon, went into the video room and watched that pitch. Stan Javier, his father was Julian Javier. When I was a kid, my glove was a Julian Javier model glove. I didn't even remember striking the guy out. I was so obsessed with the negative in my life. I was so obsessed with the moonshot that I'd given to Mark McGuire that everything was awful. Everything was awful, awful, awful. It took a friend to point out something that was really very, very special. Be that friend. And I know it's kind of a, kind of a silly, silly example to give, but it had real meaning to it. And it went even further as I started to, to the, the next day, as I looked at the video, and you see the pitch that McGuire hit on the left, it's right there, it's belt high, it's right down the middle, it's my way of saying Merry Christmas, Mark, and he hit the moonshot. And then you see the pitch where I struck out Stan Javier on, and it's a sinker, it's low and away, it's outside of the strike zone, the ball's moving. And my pitching coach, a guy named Bill Fisher, says to me, Troutwine, don't throw the ball down the middle to Mark McGuire. Thanks, coach, brilliant. I never wouldn't have thought of that, right? My teammate, Trout, what was that pitch you struck out Javier on? I said, two-seamer, sinker. Dude, that was nasty. That's your pitch, dude. Throw that more often. Your ball moves more than any other pitcher on this staff. That's where you need to be, John. That's a life teammate. Recognizing not only the good in his friend's life, but recognize that unique ability, maybe that core competency, that something in his friend's life that he does really well, and he played off that. And I remember thinking as, as the foundation started, and I, and I, was, doing, I was doing these speeches, and, and if, I, if I ask you right now, do I look like a guy that lost his son who took his own life 11 years ago? I've got a bounce in my step, I'm enjoying this, I'm making you laugh, I'm telling some jokes, I'm into this. You know why? Because I'm really good at this and I love it. And this foundation has put me in this world where I'm doing something that I'm good at, I'm doing something that I know is good and I love it. I'm throwing my sinker. I'm throwing something that, that is a, a, a gift that was given to me and I can capitalize on it. I'm doing it. What is it that we do really well? What is it that we love to do? And can we do it a little bit more often? And I started to look in the mirror and said, you know, I'm, I'm the chief customer officer. I'm a sales and marketing guy and always have been. Why am I sitting at my desk looking at a spreadsheet or analyzing a report? I'm a people person. I'm a relationship guy. I should be out visiting my customers. I should be talking to people. Because the good Lord did not put me on this earth to be the chief customer officer of an IT services company. But what Will to Live taught me is maybe the good Lord put me on this earth to build relationships, to motivate people, to inspire the people, whether it's a customer, whether it's an employee, whether it's a family member, or whether it's a stranger at a high school a thousand miles away. What is it that you do well? What is it that you love to do? What's your major gonna be? What is it that you do well? What is it that you love to do? What's your summer job gonna be? If you guys hate math, engineering school probably isn't this place to be. Very logical, right? If you love music, maybe find, find a summer job that deals with music somehow, work in a studio. Whatever it might be, put yourself in a place where you can achieve this positive passion, which is what I've been able to do here. <clears throat> and, and if you can do that, you start to recognize the little things. And this is what, you know, I was listening to Jim when he, when he was doing his, his, his speech this morning. It's these little things that mean so much. And, and when we lost Will, I remember my senses being just so switched on, and I can remember everything, and so many little things happened that were so incredible. Little smiles, little hugs, little thoughts, little comments, little cards, whatever it might be. And I remember thinking, this is so important. Look for those base hits. Don't wait for the home run. It doesn't come very often. You football players, rejoice in the good block. 
because the touchdowns don't come that often. You lacrosse players, rejoice in the ground ball. Rejoice in the good pass. It's the little things. They happen so often through the day, and that really helped me, and it still helps me today. I do not. People ask, what's different about you from now than before Will died? And I'm like, I don't really think that much about the future. I don't think 10 years down the road. I think about today. And I look for little things today. And yes, I do what I need to do about the future, but nothing like I used to be. And I'm here a little bit more. And, and I start each day as a new life, and I try to have a great life today. And, and by doing that, I, I, it, it just makes each day a little bit easier. Because the sun keeps coming up in the morning. And I think this, this concept of trying to find that positive passion. You know, you look, at that, you look at that football coach. What do you think he's saying right now? I think he's saying, hey, you did a really nice job. I'm really pleased with that, with that pass. Can keep doing that. You're going to have a great year. I had over 200 coaches in my life. And tomorrow I get to speak to the athletic, all the athletic directors in this state. And I'm going to show them that picture. And I'm going to say, of the 200 coaches in my life, seven of them get Christmas cards. And it's not because the other 193 were bad guys or bad coaches, but I remember thinking, what was the difference of those seven? Because those seven all gave me that look. They got right in my face and they screamed at me. But they didn't, the difference was, they also gave me that look when I did well. So my buddy Ab's going to come up here because I'm on film and I can't go into the stands. Come here, buddy. This is Ab Igram. He's one of my life teammates, right? So he's going to come right up to me. And so these coaches would come, these coaches would come up to me and they would do this. John Wine, you did a great <laughs> job. You finally did what we were talking about. Way to go. Sit down. <laughs> you all right, Ab? <laughs> Thanks, coach. Positive passion. They would spit in my face. They were screaming at me. But by doing that, they showed me that they cared. They showed me that they loved me. And those are the coaches that when my freshman year in college, I came running back over Thanksgiving weekend to go see them and talk to them and, and show them what we're doing and hopefully making them proud. Same with the teachers, same with the ministers, same with those trusted adults in my life that motivated and inspired me because they saved their passion for positive things. And never has it been more important to do that in today's negative world. And it's a really interesting thing. And I challenge, I'll be challenging the athletic directors tomorrow to impart this message on those coaches. They have the power to truly make the kids' lives a little bit better today. Same with the teachers, same with the, the choir masters and the chorus and the band leaders, all of these things, right? This positive passion is so important. Why does this customer love us and this customer hates us? Oh, well, we make mistakes for that customer. Well, no, we make mistakes for this customer too. What's happening here that's so good that's not happening there? Let's find it, let's bottle it, and let's apply it. Why is that kid who's got three A's and a B, very, very good student, why is he getting a C? When I was your age, my dad would have said, don't you even come home with a C. But that's how it was back then. That kid's a good student. What's not happening in that class that is happening in the others? Challenge each other that way, guys. What is it that you do well? What is it that you love to do? Incorporate that into your life and that positive passion starts to come through. And if you don't know what you do well, ask a friend and they will tell you and listen to them. That's what life teammates are about, and that's what it's, this is so important. And it's so important now more than ever. What the pandemic has done to this society is devastating. And yes, we're coming out of it, thank heavens, and that's, it's very, very great, but it has been a devastating year and a half, almost two years now. I speak to companies a lot now, and I say, how's your, how's your culture? Well, it's not as good as it used to be. I used to be able to walk into a conference room with my colleagues and we'd have the meeting and we'd walk out of the meeting and we'd say, boy, that meeting, that meeting sucked. Or that guy's a jerk or this is great. And we, and, but we talked. And then in the break room, we trash talked because the, 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 the Red Sox beat the Yankees and he's a big Yankee fan. So I couldn't let that one go. Today, we're in a room 
by ourselves and the meeting ends. I don't walk out with anybody. I click a red button that says leave. Poof, I'm alone. It's hard right now. You guys lost a year of your high school. Oh my gosh, that's devastating. High school was my favorite four years. I had four of them, four wonderful high school years. You only got three. I'm sorry about that. Once again, I'm impressed with how you all are navigating through this, this challenges. Get on a plane. What do they say? Put your own mask on first. Yes, I want you to help others. Yes, I want you to feel the joy and how your will to live increases when you do help others. But I also want you to look in the mirror and I want you to put yourself first. I want you to take care of yourself first. Give yourself me time. I said it to, to Jim when we first talked. I said, you're going to have to take care of yourself. Your family needs this. I had to do this. I had to, I had to give myself John time. And then I gave myself Will time. And I booked it. I booked it in my day. I'm going for a walk and no, I'm not even taking my phone. No one can bug me. And I'm going to go for a walk and it's going to be an hour of just John time. And it's just so important, especially now, give your, because this 24-7 world will run you ragged. Book your time. Book that time to play your guitar, to, to go for a walk, to read some book that has nothing to do with school, whatever it might be, something that, that, is, that you're passionate about. Find it. It's important, guys, because this life will get in the way and it'll drive you down. So help each other. Help each other with that. You know, when the pandemic started, the foundation couldn't, I couldn't speak. I couldn't go anywhere. Everything was closed and I didn't know what to do. So I decided to um, put together 100 days of hope and all the various messages from, from the speeches that we've given and what I've learned. And every single day I spent 20 minutes and I created these little 100 days of hope that I put on Instagram and Facebook and the website about the importance of just being there for each other. And when the 100 days were up, I struggled because that was John time. And it was like my pandemic project, I called it, that, that I was gonna do something that was positive in this crazy craziness. And it made me realize that, that every day is an opportunity to start over. Every day is an opportunity to, to rethink through this, to recreate, re, reform or improve the relationships in my life. And the concept of, of let's have a great life today is a good one. Sun is going to come up tomorrow. And I just, I ask that you, you know, give, give the best you can give each day. And some days you're going to be able to give more than others. But it was interesting how when I was done doing that, there was an emptiness because I didn't have John time after that. I said, gosh, I need to figure something else. What else can I do now? That made me rise above the challenges that the world had, had placed on us during these, this crazy time. And it's, it's this concept as a minister here in, in, in this area, is actually in the Baltimore area, where he just said, I'm convinced. You know, 90% is, is what happens to you and 10% is how you choose to react. What the Costco family is doing right now is just so impressive and it's so hard. But they're choosing, they're choosing to react in a way that honors Kevin. What you guys have done with your nonprofit is that. That's the differentiator, differentiator guys. When, 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 when life throws you that curveball, how do you choose to react to it? That's, what, that's the challenge. Remember the 90-10. It's not 99-1. When I heard this, I'm a positive guy. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm positive. I'm going to be I'm going to be that how I react to it, 99, right? And he stopped me and he said, John, it's, it's 90, it's 10, 90. Give yourself the 10. Give yourself the 10. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be sad. I cry every day. The days that I don't cry, I'm worse. It's interesting. I cry every day, 11 years. The days that I don't cry, I'm worse. Give yourself the 10.
It's so important. It's so important for us to be there for each other in these tough times. When the tears come, welcome them. Embrace them. It's love. And love is always good. We all have a story, guys, as we wrap this up. You have friends that are struggling. You understand the devastation that can occur when illnesses become tragedies. Remember that when you're about to make fun of somebody. Remember that when you see somebody sitting by themselves. Remember that when you see somebody being treated unfairly. Life is hard, you know that. Honor yourself, honor your friends, honor your family, honor the loved ones that you lost by being there. Inspire them. Show them the positive that exists in their lives because no matter who you are, you've got life teammates that need you. So be there for them. You'll feel better. Finally, guys, it's, it's what I'm seeing here what I'm seeing in these, in these pullovers, what I'm seeing in, in the way you all have embraced Jim and Kristen and the family and, and, and been there for them. Yes, it helps them so much, but it helps you. They need you and you need them. Your friends need you and you need them. So talk about that. I'm here for you, pal, right? You know that, right? That's so important. Love is what's gonna heal. It's been 11 years for me, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Not because of time. Time had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Love did. My friends did. The human spirit craves companionship. So deliver that to those people that you love and be there for them. And it starts with being able and not being nervous and not being worried or, or, not, or being afraid to say, I love you. It's so important. Just remember that. And if you're shy and, and you're, you're afraid to, to express yourself that way, then package it in a different way. And that's what we've done for you with Love You Man. So I want every single person in this room right now, turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, man. Let's see it. All right, stop, 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 stop. Stop, 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 stop. All right, I, guys, guys, I didn't ask you to start hugging each other. I just asked you to turn and say, love you, man. But no, you had to hug. You had to smile. And this wave of energy, positive energy, just filled the building. It was great. I think that's important. I know that I learned from it. That maybe the benefactor of the, of the I love you transition might not be the receiver. Maybe it's actually the person saying it. So drop a love you man on your friends. Drop a love you man on your parents. Drop a love you man on people you think could need it. Because love heals, right? And that's what we're doing here today. That's what the Cusco family is challenged with. They just, they need to go where the love is. And that's what's happening here. And it's really fun to see. And this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard. But it's also going to be great. And it's going to be so important. Our, lo our lost loved ones want us to live. They want us to smile. They want us to be there for each other. And that's what I'm asking you guys to do. So know that I love you guys. And I wish you all the very, very best. Love you, man. And I'll see you again soon, I hope. Thank you very, very much.
seniors, just sit tight for about five minutes. We're on a delay with uh, a stream into the classrooms, and I want to make sure the classrooms can finish the, um, the presentation. So just sit tight with me for five minutes. 